Magla Hills, the heaven of Islamabad. The abode of God, a place where you can explore your soul and meet power of nature. Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Views and News, and I'm Faisal Rahman, live from our Islamabad studios. Today, we'll be talking about this Afghan peace process. As we all know, that on Saturday, uh, the first, uh, this uh, tenth round basically was the first day of the tenth round of talks. They were held in Doha. A lot of issues came under discussion. Primarily, uh, what I heard on CNN was pretty interesting that the delegation which was meeting the delegation of Taliban, in fact, uh, really. Uh, said sorry to them regarding the statements issued by none other than the President of USA, Mr. Donald Trump. So th the talks resumed. Primarily, there were a couple of very important points which came under discussion. Number one was about the ceasefire, that there should be ceasefire in Afghanistan so that this process uh, could be uh, meaningful, could sort of uh, yield some positive results which both the parties are seeking. Second again was very important and that was about uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, electoral standoff, I mean, who is the president or who will be the president, that's still uh, a major debate still going on in Afghanistan. That was also a major part of discussion. Other than that, they also discussed in detail about uh, reduction in violence, whether you talk about uh, bomb blasts or you talk about certain uh, attacks on certain mil military uh, establishments for that matter. And on top, uh, the most important part was about the uh, support of the intra-Afghan negotiations. I think that holds the key. These were the four major areas which came under discussion and one of the Afghan uh, delegates also pointed out that they are concerned about the Taliban hideouts in Pakistan. Now, these are a couple of very important areas which came under discussion. As we all know, that Zalbe Khalil Dad was also uh, in Afghanistan right after the surprise visit of the American President Donald Trump. So, let's hope and let's assume that things do uh, move in the right direction. But as far as the talks are concerned, I mean, no fruitful result so far has been achieved. To talk about this, let me introduce you to our panelists. We have with us in our studio on my uh, right is Air Vice Marshal retired Ikramullah Bhatti Saab, who's a senior defense analyst. Sir. Thank you very much. And we have with us Omar Hayata Basi Saab, who's a foreign affairs expert. Thank you very much, Bhai Saab. Thank and you. we have with us in our studio Ambassador Aslam Rizvi Saab, who's a former senior diplomat. So thank you very much. Thank and you. now, sir, since uh, we'll be talking about these four or five important points, let's start off from this particular point, sir. One of the delegates, a senior member of the Afghan delegation, pointed out that there are still hideouts of Taliban inside Pakistan and they're worried about it. But now, as far as we know or we understand, sir, that most of those areas neighboring uh, the Afghan border, they have been clean. Majority of the problem makers, I would say, they have been either arrested or killed, eliminated. Things are a lot better now as compared to a few years ago, sir. Alhamdulillah, we do not hear about bomb blasts anymore. And this is, I think, a significant, significant achievement of the current government of Pakistan, sir. Do you still believe that uh, whatever the Afghan members said about Pakistan, how much is that correct, sir? Well, I think we have crossed this bridge and we are way ahead now. And uh, someone from the Afghan government saying this at this stage is, uh, I, I, I think they, they're just trying to uh, rope in Pakistan on the behest of maybe the Indians, on the behest of maybe the Americans, uh, so that uh, Pakistan, which is now taking a sigh of relief and it has been able to clear its name of this stigma that the, the Indians or the, or the Europeans had been able to uh, uh, place on Pakistan, uh, that we have been exporting terrorism or words to that effect. Uh, but the fact remains that we have been able to win this war and uh, we've been able to clean up and clear up all this area. The border has been fenced mostly. And th there is hardly any unchecked, unnoticed, unobserved movement across the border. And at this stage, uh, when uh, uh, the, the Americans are already in negotiation with the Taliban for the last uh, over a year, and the 10th round is in, uh, is in place. And uh, 
at this stage, uh, why don't they ask the Taliban? Are you there in a Pakistan or not? Why, why, why do they mention Pakistan at this stage? I think it is uh, futile and it is uh, absolutely unconcerned and it has nothing to Would do... Would you consider that another attempt from the advanced side to malign Pakistan once more, sir? Certainly, uh, and, uh, be because they have not given it up. And uh, when they fail in countering the Taliban as a force, uh, countering the Taliban as a claimant to, to uh, a, a position, a status, uh, as a player in, uh, in, in uh, Afghanistan, uh, so, this, this is how they are trying to mitigate or alleviate the importance of Taliban and their strength that they blame Pakistan or they malign Pakistan uh, in this manner. Uh, whereas the fact remains that uh, they have been offering Taliban to open up offices in Kabul, they have been uh, offering to accept Taliban as a political force and at this stage uh, with all those offers in, in the background, they blame Pakistan. Uh, or the Taliban to have hideout or safe havens in Pakistan, I think it, it's absolutely out of context, out of place. I mean, it, it is not at all contributory or uh, constructive uh, towards the, uh, uh, the, the process that Part is going on. Part of the blame on. game primarily, sir. Yes, certainly. Your take, sir, on the same point. Mm, I'll, I'll uh, talk about first how I see the entire system uh, and what's going on in U.S., Taliban, Afghanistan peace talks. And I, I believe it's flawed and I don't really take it seriously. Why? Number one, because you see, the government in Afghanistan, if I speak from the perspective of Taliban, is a puppet government. And they're not willing to sit down so far with this puppet regime. They call U.S. puppet in Afghanistan. They're not representatives of Afghanistan. So now if I have to see from the government perspective, the Afghanistan government perspective, they don't need, it's not about blame game, it's all about survival. It's about finding an scapegoat and finding a reason to blame your failures. So it's about, they're blaming Pakistan. And even for instance, if I see principally, there are Taliban hideouts in Pakistan. Let us suppose, for instance, there are. <clears throat> in a legal conception of U.S. Taliban peace talks, U.S. and the officials, including Zalmay, have accepted them as a stakeholder, not as a terrorist organization. You never negotiate with the terrorists. So suppose there are hideouts in Pakistan. How does that make it relevant and why there is no peace in Afghanistan, one. Secondly, what I want to tell you is that the entire process of U.S. Taliban peace talks is not, in fact, to establish peace in Afghanistan. You have to see the political dynamics, what what's going for, on in what Washington. Is it, for, it is because President Trump is desperate to have something Sort of on his court, are, are you and the next electoral campaign, see what? There is impeachment inquiry going on. That is damaging his reputation. In the next election, next year, he's also a candidate. And he wants whatever, something on his scorecard that, see guys, that's what I'm doing. And I'm serious about it. But it's eating their own words, one. Two ways, if, for instance, they, we consider it very seriously, like that's a serious business. You know what? We are trying to ensure peace in Afghanistan and long-lasting peace. That I already, I, I've always said that a number of times, that's only possible if you leave it to Afghanistan. So the fundamental point when these both parties wanted to sit down and do some kind of negotiations, there were two central point agendas. Taliban wanted withdrawal, means withdrawal, zero troops. That was the first point. Two, U.S. wanted ceasefire, means no violence. So now you see both of them gradually moving away from their first point, and that was, we're trying to withdraw or reduce the number of troops rather in Afghanistan. Rather, they have increased the number, sir. They've rather, and then on the part of Taliban, they're now saying, we're trying to tell them on how to reduce violence in Afghanistan. You see that. So this is all about political electioneering of what's going on in the U.S. and how President Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah, how they want to see themselves in the power. So it's about, it, it's an artificial, non-serious political campaign 
which is compelled by their local constituencies, whether that is in Kabul or that is in Washington. It's not a serious time. And we don't have to take it seriously, by the way. So what we do need is, in fact, to focus more on an indigenous, internalized efforts of building peace in Afghanistan, if that is truly our objective. Now, that's, that's where uh, the intra-Afghan dialogue comes in. Basically. But here's the point. Even an intra-Afghan dialogue, would you really, I mean, I agree, let's say I agree, President Ashraf Ghani is an Afghani, fair enough. Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah is an Afghani, fair enough. But what is their stake in the system? What is, and what qualifies their stake in the system? That's the stance you hear from Af Afghan Taliban. They're not, so far, they've not even accepted. And you know, one of the major point in Zalmay's talks and restructuring of this peace talk is in fact to compel Taliban to agree on this single point that Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah are stakeholders. Please sit down and talk to them. They're not willing to accept that because the system the of governance see, isn't there yet. I mean, it's been so many weeks now. They wouldn't. We do they not wouldn't. Even and even if they do, the next look, there's I mean, going, they there are about 300,000 votes. See, uh, I mean, there, there, there are two they, things I want to tell you. Two, two. Okay. One, it's, it's, it's dangerous for both. I mean, they're forever their strength, for whatever their strength is. If Taliban, for example, their political Taliban, the Doha Taliban, agree to give Ashraf Ghani some kind of stake in the intra Afghan dialogue, that's going to create a wide between field commanders, Taliban field commanders in Afghanistan, and, those who are and the political, and they're going to fight, and they might, they will continue so fighting. You, primarily, so, what what happened what? today is that the people on the field and people who are negotiating, they could be. Uh, it can be a, a wide between oh, them yeah. and disconnect, and that's going to be dangerous because those people might start fighting with each other, and that's now, going one, to one increase quick, the bloodshed. One quick yeah. comment before we <clears throat> move on to Ambassador Aslam Rizvi. You you really believe that? Uh, those who are negotiating primarily with the American authorities or with the Afghan government for that matter, have enough say as far as the decision making is concerned that they can actually persuade the people on the field that look from time period A to time period B, there should be no violence. Will they accept that kind of work? No. That's what I'm saying. All right. All right. Because I'll if they move from that. their if they move from their center point agenda, you know what's the center point? The focus of their agenda is withdrawal of troops. If there is no withdrawal, let me tell you, the field commanders in Afghanistan are not going to listen to the what political we have Taliban and Doha. Primarily, they are being told that if they immediately withdraw or take away all the forces, then yes, then is going is to be the major problem for Afghanistan because it is going to be a civil war-like situation. Taliban can take over, anything can happen, sir. This is what we have witnessed in the past also. Rizvi, sir, first of all, your take on this point, sir, that Pakistan is again being made a sca scapegoat, sir. Uh, scapegoat, and we all know that uh, this has been on for quite some time now. Every time, whenever something goes wrong or the negotiation process fails, Pakistan is always blamed for that. But this time, I mean, look at the kind of effort we have made, sir. The Chinese, the Russians, even the Americans are recognizing our efforts, sir. Yes, the, this is a very old um, accusation against Pakistan of having, you know, um, the Khani network and terrorist net, uh, network within Pakistan. Um, uh, we have answered this in many ways, and uh, as the other uh, two um, uh, participants here have uh, highlighted this uh, part of it. But let me just uh, say this, that, uh, you know, the present uh, situation uh, right now when the talks are being resumed uh, is directly because of the Pakistan's initiative, Pakistan's help uh, to bring it about. It was in September <clears throat> that uh, you had the ISI chief visiting Kabul, meeting with his counterpart, national security advisor, um, which and during which they discussed uh, the release of prisoners. Importantly, um, the uh, um, Haqqani's uh, brother, uh, the, uh, the number two of the uh, Haqqani network, and one of the other one is his uncle, three of them, uh, which then broke the ice, and this is one of the, one of the major demands by the Taliban uh, in the Doha talks, which uh, broke down. So, 
at the, that level, there was no mention about uh, uh, the any, you know, uh, hideouts being here by the national security advisor. Somebody here is, you know, trying to spoil the thing because the what has happened and this release was vital uh, as a confidence building measure, which has led to the resumption of talks, you know. So um, the and of course later on we also had that um, uh, release of the you know two professors, uh, Professor King and uh, Professor Weeks from the uh, American University in exchange. So this has been a, a major step. Now the basis of what had happened, of course, in the last round of talks they, they broke down, as you know, was uh, the um, the killing of an American soldier amongst others. Uh, when President Trump abruptly ended the uh, talks. Now... Uh, After that, another helicopter was also shot down, if you remember. Sorry? Sir. Yeah. 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 But, and then now we have him visiting uh, Bagram and uh, to, uh, for Thanksgiving with the American troops and saying that the uh, Taliban have agreed to ceasefire. I don't think this could be a correct statement uh, that they have agreed to a ceasefire. Taliban have been very clear right from the word there were two main issues in the on the first round of talks um, american withdrawal the second was uh, no sanctuaries uh, sanctuaries for the terrorists on the soil of afghanistan that was phase one we are still stuck on phase one uh, in phase one uh, there's no clarity as to the um, withdrawal of the american troops they're talking about thirteen thousand troops of, of that they say they can make do with eight thousand five hundred Bases they are talking about 2,000 Taliban won none. Um, as far as the uh, the um, uh, uh, using the ground Taliban ground for the uh, uh, you know terrorist organizations, uh, the undertaking has been given by the Taliban, but the Americans are skeptical about it. They said they may not be able to honor it, or uh, you know once they pull out. The phase two is where uh, the other issue uh, came about. That was intra-Afghan uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, now, when you come to intra-Afghan dialogue, you see that um, we have a problem in uh, both, uh, first in, in Afghanistan, because of the standoff, as you said, in the elections. You know, they're held in September. Right now, uh, you know, both of them are uh, daggers drawn. There's no clarity between one, Abdullah Abdullah and President Ghani. You know that 2014, they had the same situation. Absolutely. The Americans came, they gobbled them together and so on. So uh, this is on one hand. Secondly, the uh, uh, Afghan uh, Taliban have uh, more or less uh, agreed in principle to have indirect talks with them. You know, they have accepted them in these discussions as not as the Afghan government, but uh, as a one of the stakeholders. Correct. So they have been brought into uh, this uh, ambit of uh, discussions. And it is only after that that they were talking about uh, uh, having a ceasefire and then a peace agreement. Now we have nowhere reached any stage uh, where we can say that, uh, you know, there will be a ceasefire. So a lot needs to be done and <clears throat> we have to make all out efforts because this is a golden opportunity for not only America, and as you know, President Trump, uh, before his election, had uh, made this his point to withdraw his forces from here. All right. Number one, and he's facing himself, you know, uh, impeachment at home, likely to face impeachment at home. Elections are coming there also. So he has to renew his stake to try and show that he is Something not a Something interesting talk. happened also in Bethesda, uh, when the American delegation, in fact, uh, felt very sorry for what... Uh, in fact, was stated by the U.S. President Donald Trump. And that's how they resumed. So obviously, three months ago, when the uh, negotiations were stalled, but now people are still hopeful that maybe at least they're talking. Sir, we have been uh, joined in by Raymula Yusuzai Saab, sir. Okay. Uh, let's see what uh, Yusuzai Saab has to share with us. Assalamu alaikum, alaykum, ji. Assalamu alaykum, salam. Yusuzai Saab, thank you very much for talking to us, sir. Now, first of all, sir, uh, this 10th round of talks uh, that's just resumed on Saturday. Do you believe that it is going to yield some sort of positive results, sir, or is it just going to be an SOP, a regular exercise, and that's, that's it? You know, if not the 10th round, the next round will be very, very positive because, you know, almost all the issues have been discussed and agreed upon. 
And, uh, you know, the Americans are now pushing for these two things. They want a ceasefire. They want Taliban also to agree to talk directly with the Afghan government. Uh, these are new demands, uh, you know, and uh, this is after the agreement was reached. But then the talks were scrapped by President Trump. So I think that the Taliban would be trying to hold their ground. Uh, they have agreed to enter Afghan meetings. They have already done that in Moscow and Qatar. Uh, maybe this time there will be better representation from the Afghan government, unlike the Qatar meeting where only a few officials came. Uh, but I think the ceasefire issue also will be resolved because Taliban will observe ceasefire with the U.S. and NATO forces where the withdrawal will take place. So the next uh, issue will be ceasefire with the Afghan government, and that will be discussed when they start having these intra-Afghan dialogue, maybe first in China and then in other places. So I believe that these are very positive developments. Uh, you know, this uh, dialogue process has started. Uh, I don't think there will be any turning back. There may be hurdles, there may be breakdowns, but eventually the talks will continue and it will lead to something positive. Okay, you, you seem to be very optimistic over here, sir. <laughs> but looking at the past, sir, looking at the history of these uh, dialogues or these uh, negotiation processes and everything, at the last moment, sir, something happens. Either India is playing a very negative role or, or maybe those forces present inside Afghanistan are also not willing and they maybe they want to continue the way it is, sir. <clears throat> you, no, do, no. Do, These sir. things will have to be you know, figured out. Uh, I am saying that the talks are heading in a positive direction. There may eventually be a peace agreement, but then the next challenge will be whether this peace agreement will be implemented, whether it will lead to real peace, whether all the stakeholders you know, will agree to observe the ceasefire. All these issues are very important issues. And that's why, you know, we cannot predict anything about Afghanistan. But I am positive about the talks and maybe eventually a peace agreement. Right. As you said, there are spoilers. And, uh, you know, there are countries like India, which are spoilers, which have been spoilers. There are non-state actors like Daesh, you know, maybe even Al-Qaeda. But they do not have that kind of strength uh, which can spoil the whole process. So they will make their efforts. But, uh, you know, Daesh has been uh, almost defeated now in Afghanistan. And Al-Qaeda is very, very insignificant in this region. So I believe that uh, the biggest, you know, threat will come from countries like India. Last, and those uh, countries which are not part of this process, you know, right, so right. that, so, that is last a comment, uh, Yusuf Zahir uh, last comment. What do you think, what could be the reason that there is no announcement as far as who is going to be the next president of Afghanistan, when it's going to be Ashraf Ghani or it's going to be Abdullah Abdullah? What is the reason for that? And so, do you believe that there, there is a possibility that there could be another election? I mean, maybe, say, in two months, three months, six months, whenever... Could be held, sir. You know, there is uh, this intra-Afghan dialogue, and if it makes progress, I think then one of the issues will be, uh, you know, deciding uh, the next steps in Afghanistan uh, regarding democracy, regarding the constitution. And I think in that process, there may also be a discussion on having a caretaker or interim government. That actually has been the demand of uh, most of the candidates for president, except the two who were in power, Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani. So it's not only Taliban, you know, who may eventually seek uh, a government of technocrats or a caretaker government. So I think this election, you know, where the turnout was, uh, you know, historically low, uh, and because, you know, uh, both candidates are claiming victory and they won't accept you know, the other as the winner. So this is going to create more problems than it can resolve. Maybe right. that is one reason why the election result is not being announced. Uh, maybe the election result, you know, 
is being delayed purposely, maybe on the U.S., uh, you know, uh, has a hand in all this. So we have to see. But, you know, even if the result is announced, it will not be accepted by many Afghans. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Himala Yusuf. Now, sir, another point now. That is about uh, the, the current scenario, and I was, uh, in fact, referring to one is about the ceasefire. The Trump administration wants that there should be an absolute ceasefire and then we'll proceed further. But on, at the same time, so don't you think that uh, whatever the Americans are doing, because when you see them attacking the Taliban through those drones and all, I mean, the way they're killing them, it seems as if they're playing a video game sitting in California or Silicon Valley somewhere, sir. Honestly, uh, maybe in, <laughs> in Nevada or somewhere. The point is that it should be stop from both the sides. Only then the ne negotiations can proceed further, sir. If one side is, uh, in fact, getting themselves committed to do something, the other side has to do the same. Well, you see, if you, if you go back that uh, after nearly a year-long process, having undergone nine rounds of negotiations and having declared that we are almost 90% close to the signing of, a, an, agreement. of, of an agreement, and uh, suddenly, it was halted in its tracks. And to my knowledge, the reason was that after nine, uh, nine rounds of negotiation, the, the American had been able to achieve only a commitment from the Taliban that they would not allow their soil to be used by any terrorist organization against any other country. And in return, the, the Americans were to give out a timetable of their withdrawal. That was the agreement that was to be signed. And when... Uh, Mr. Trump looked at it and he suddenly realized that it's too less for him to agree to after such a long effort. And they had already lost more than 2,400 American soldiers, losing one odd soldier and declaring that as to be the cause of a nearly year-long process was, you know... Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. So the fact was that he, he suddenly realized that it was not good enough. So he, he scuttled the entire process. And now they have come up with new demands, uh, in which, of course, they want uh, reduction and total uh, seizure of violence and an intra-Afghan dialogue. This is something which the Taliban were not prepared to in the first place. And the fact is the Taliban are, as of now, not a political force. They are a militant organization. The only leverage that they have is violence. And if they seize violence, they lose leverage. They lose relevance. And if they're holding on to... A lot of people do believe even if they contest in genuine, clean elections, still they won't be able to win any seats as such. Uh, they will not be having any any reasonable numbers, sir. Well, you see, they... Uh, if, I'm if talking you, about free, fair and transparent elections. You yeah. see, if... if uh, because uh, Taliban, of course, are a tribal society. They are very sharp, clear ethnic divisions. And Taliban are mostly Pashtun. Pashtun are around anything around 47 to about 52 percent of uh, total population. Total almost population, half of them, yeah. Almost half. And if there is, if we if we accept ethnic uh, ethnicity as uh, uh, as a re reason for loyalty and uh, and support, then Taliban should be winning that much, that much of uh, support. Uh, in, in, any, in, in any election. But as of now, you see, they, they have violence as a, as, as a leverage and they will not be prepared to uh, forego this uh, leverage uh, without having achieved anything which they have been fighting for for such a long time. And as we just discussed, that they, they have the, uh, the, the, the commander in the field or the foot soldiers in the field and coming to, and, and then they, they have got the negotiators at the political end of their organization. And I am sure they are fully in touch, fully in contact, and they, they, they realize the sensitivities and the aspirations of their soldiers. And they just cannot forego that because, uh, as we already discussed, there could be, you know, a revolt. And already we know that Daesh has major chunk of its recruits who are ex-Taliban, who have been disillusioned uh, by whatever, uh, you know, uh, modus operandi the Tal Taliban leadership has now adopted in negotiating with the Americans and then you know, talking of things like uh, giving up violence and sitting down with uh, people who they have already uh, have already been considered as uh, uh, puppets. So uh, they, they, they are, of course, quite sensitive to it. So if uh, the Americans have come up with this uh, huge uh, order of uh, discontinuing violence and sitting down with the uh, 
Kabul regime, and in return, they they have not offered what are the the Americans are prepared to give. Are they going to give out a timeline of withdrawal? Are they going to, uh, going to give some uh, share of uh, leadership to the Taliban in in next political dispensation in uh, Kabul? That is yet to be seen. So I think now we have reached a situation uh, or a stage of negotiation which is going to be the toughest so far, because now the mm. stakes are uh, and the cards are clearly out as to who wants what. Exactly. So so far it was hidden. It was not known. And now it is very clearly the both these sides have defined their positions, and they are both very tough positions. It's all about give and take now. Yes. Now they to now give how much? That's yes. the question. Now they'll have to agree to Absolutely. this. Absolutely. No, no, no. One, one quick point, mm -hmm. sir. Now, uh, since we'll be talking about another important area, and that is the visit of the Taliban delegation in, uh, to Moscow, sir. They were in Moscow. And obviously, they are getting a lot of uh, sort of you know uh, negotiating points uh, from them also. So primarily, there is a lot of involvement uh, of the Russians in these negotiations, maybe indirectly, as far as Doha summit is concerned or Doha talks are concerned. But uh, there seems to be some sort of a support for the Taliban also, sir. Maybe from some other uh, countries which are really interested in having peace there, including Pakistan for that Iran matter. Iran, yeah. Iran for that matter. China, why not? China also. Uh, because this OBR or, or, or One Road, One Belt initiative, I mean, that is very important. And I think in order to have uh, uh, that as a success model, I think Afghanistan's peace is the most important uh, aspect in that. Do you think that since negotiations, obviously Americans will try to have an edge or the upper hand over there, but when you talk about the Taliban or to talk about their representatives, they're also getting some sort of maybe moral support, maybe some sort of a diplomatic support in one way or the other from other parties as well. See, here is the thing, you know, other parties, when you say they're outside Afghanistan, right? Whether that is Pakistan or Iran or China or Russia or U.S. Okay, so let me try to tell you, allow me to complete my argument. So what's the fundamental problem? If we on one, for instance, say Taliban are non-state actors and they have the leverage of violence, we agree, they're not representative. You said if they contest election, they're not going to get and they know that. They're not going to get. Let's say, let's agree. How about the present government? Are, are they really truly representatives of Afghanistan with this low turnout? Do you really think that? Even they're not representatives of Afghanistan. Despite the that low takes, turnout, the, <clears throat> that takes the us to a serious question. Is that still 300,000 votes are disputed, right? Are disputed. Yeah. So that takes us to a very serious question. It's a question of governance. And a governance model or a system that is suitable for Afghanistan. We try to look at it from a Western way of looking at it. That is democracy, an election, an interim government, and technocrats, and national government. And then on the sidelines, we do talk about in the peripheries, intra Afghan dialogue is also a way forward. Listen, intra Afghan dialogue has to be an intra Afghan dialogue the way intra Afghan dialogue should be. So it lies in the indigenous wisdom of Afghanistan. So what is for the externals? When I say what is for the externals, the, the external which cannot power. financially or economically support itself, sir. That's the point. I, at the I agree. Every so single support them penny in that. is coming See, from the, USA. I agree. So what right now is that you're using, you're also, you know, when you negotiate, is, is US not negotiating violence as a bargaining uh, Indeed, tool? They are. they are using violence, as you very rightly said that. So, if you're also using violence and they're also using violence, then the question is, do you really want to maintain peace in Afghanistan? No. So, what is for external powers? Call it, let's say, for example, I know we have very good relationship and we're playing our quite positive role in stability in Afghanistan. At least that's how we claim, right? Non-militaristic option. We claim, I agree. Okay, fair enough. What we need to do is, in fact, to make sure that Afghan present government, which is not truly representative of Afghanis, they can sustain whatever system there is and they think and find out the solution of their problems from their local indig indigenous wisdom. Why are we so overwhelmed and framing them and giving them so restrictive options that that's what you do and that's what you do? You know, that's not the way of doing it. That's not going to bring peace. You know, Pakistan is, is uh, I mean, our experience with democracy is way older than Afghanistan's experience in democracy. And look at the turnout ratio in Pakistan. 
Look at how constituents in Pakistan see democracy, or have we really been able to be a democratic country in its true sense with all its follies and you know problems? You're talking about Afghanistan. What happened in 2014 is going to happen during this election, and it's even going to happen in the next election. Why? You because don't see this, any change. You don't no, see any because, positive see, happening see, in the future. I tell you, that's, that's very interesting. Abdullah Abdullah, he's passed a number of statements, chief executive, he's passed a number of statements questioning the process of elections. Afghans are not even familiar with what do you mean by election? What do you mean by voting and what do you mean by democracy? A lot of people do believe that, you know, the reason, the primary reason for this low turnout was that the same two characters were again competing primarily. These two were supposed to be number one and number two. And what difference will they make? Even, let's suppose, Ashraf Ghani loses the election, let's suppose, True. and Abdullah Abdullah comes in. Or yep. Abdullah Abdullah loses and Ashraf Ghani still remains the president. What difference will it make? What difference has it, it earlier won't. made? True, it won't. You know what? Even... I tell you very frankly, even President Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah do not even understand the democratic process, frankly. I mean, they're into their personal interest and personal stakes. They both want power and they, they'll have a power sharing. So their opponents and the same government. Is this not funny? You know, even if, uh, let's say, there are a number of other contestants, the question is, is democracy going to solve the problems in Afghanistan and how are we trying to look at it from Question one way, there has to be democracy. democracy after this, all this turmoil. It has to be intra-Afghan dialogue and let Afghans see what is suitable, what maintains peace and order in Afghanistan from Khurasani and from Pashto wisdom. Let's not see from Anglo-Saxon, American, British, European wisdom. That's the fundamental point. And what is for external powers and countries outside? I mean, they've already made it a mess. U.S. made Afghanistan a mess. We agree. Now, what they can do, so if they're the really serious, they've made a mess across the globe, right? Yeah. If we agree that they're really serious about maintaining peace, look at the indifference of President Trump. He says, we're not there to maintain order and uh, ensure peace and building a nation building in Afghanistan. It's for Afghanistan it's law it's enforcement remember, agencies and military. No more money for look, Afghanistan. it's highly indifferent. Yeah. And then on the same time, you're using violence. So what you can do if you're truly sincere in man, maintaining peace and order in Afghanistan, what needs to be done is to help Afghans sustain, give them aid, facilitate them. Look, you talked about two people who were swept, exchange of prisoners, two white people. This becomes news in CNN and BBC, and this decides the strategy of the word superpower because they're white with the skin. Excuse me? How about the common Afghanis who are being killed in the streets of Afghanistan? Now, you're confusing. Where is the being ground? Look. You talk about madrasas where kids they, are studying they're the being being killed like, you know, like they're not even treated like humans. And then you're, you're trying to confuse between Taliban as a group and then there is Al-Qaeda as a group and then there is Daesh as a group. Forget about these groups. There is violence. And the people are being killed. And those people are also the same humans like two people who have been released. Absolutely. But just that they're the no, white no, no, skin. Now, no, Ambassador Saab, let's suppose, as we earlier were talking about the spoilers, for example, Yusuf Zai Saab seemed very optimistic. He said, well, there is, I mean, the probability of the success of these negotiations is pretty high. That's what I've understood. What if something happens that tomorrow there's some attack and maybe one American soldier or three other uh, get injured or maybe mm, something else happens of a similar sort and the Taliban do not even claim the responsibility for that right sir anything can happen do you think that is again going to derail the entire process sir well you know the um, they were stalled for almost President three months Trump as mentioned here uh, also doing the negotiation when they broke down uh, felt that um, um, he, uh, he was, uh, didn't get what he would like to have. Uh, and the mere fact that they had announced the withdrawal of the troops was a trump card which they had. And so he was, he from a negotiating point of view, it was uh, a, a weakness uh, on their part. On the other hand, we are talking about uh, the uh, violence as a means and a leverage uh, to make your point. 
uh, we have seen that the um, uh, call it violence or call it uh, the military uh, action the Americans and the uh, IS forces had been uh, uh, the international forces have been trying to use that in order to subdue the Taliban and they miserably failed and even now uh, you know although the general uh, uh, talks about General Mark the Joint Chief of Staff that we have killed so many people and so on the fact is the Taliban have an upper hand on wireless um, they are in they a commanding position. They can strike whenever they want to. They are in a commanding position, okay. Now, um, the, um, the talks uh, broke down um, and th there was a stalemate uh, and uh, there was a need for them to resume because ultimately the only way forward in Afghanistan is through dialogue. What form it takes, that's a different story, but the only way forward is dialogue. And from that point of view, I agree with um, Mr. Yusuf Zai when he said that it, uh, one should be optimistic because you have to, only way you can settle this matter is through dialogue. So the fact that they are back on the table and they are talking, odd incident taking place here and there, I don't think will come about again because uh, they are for the reason that, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the uh, Americans, uh, our previous president, everybody is committed to pull out from there. If um, the President Trump uh, doesn't get impeached and he you know, comes back in power, he will probably uh, uh, will try and use it uh, to be able to pull out from there in one form or the other. Now, the, the important thing is that Pakistan has always been saying and has always been supportive to the fact that, as rightly pointed out here, any solution has to be Afghan-led and uh, you know, Afghan-owned. And it is for them to decide how they are going to go. I mean, let's go back to the time when the Soviets pulled out from there. And, you know, they were left on their own. They found their own solution. Look at the condition of the country at that time. How peaceful they were within the country. You know, look when at the, the law and order, Basel? look at drugs and so on. They were not... Oh, yes, the bothering. poppy cultivation just went down to almost nothing. Exactly. And this is 9-11, and they are the ones that look at what they have done to their country now. So I think it is important, and the main objective of the Taliban is their focus will remain on the, uh, the withdrawal of foreign forces from Afghanistan. Let these people go out from there, let them find their own solution from there. We can facilitate, we can encourage. And there is a very strong feeling in the regional countries. Uh, within Afghanistan itself, there have been peace marches also, uh, internationally, uh, in the region. So, and the UN, everybody is there, except, of course, some countries who have their own agendas, uh, like uh, one of our neighbors here. So the uh, um, uh, idea should be we should encourage them for talk. We should give uh, all the support we can. Any impediments that come, we should try and help out, like we did uh, with regard to the release of Afghan prisoners and so on. Look how many of those now, are now in the negotiating uh, so, so one last quick comment. Uh, don't you think these nego negotiations should be also time-bound, sir? Because this is the 10th round, maybe, I mean, we'll keep hearing about the 20th, maybe the 30th after a few years. Don't you think this, there has to be some settlements uh, within a given time frame? You, you cannot dictate that. It depends on the situation on the ground, uh, how the negotiations are going. I mean, 40 years have passed and the Afghans have been <laughs> struggling from there. 18 years, the uh, forces have been there. These talks have only started only a year ago. Basically, the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. and Afghan, when they agreed to it, something which Pakistan has been saying for di dialogue for a long time. So we have to we have patience. We have to encourage these talks. If we are negotiation is the only way to bring about and you know a stable and peaceful Afghanistan. All right, all right. So quick comment before so, I wrap. Very quick. It's a fundamental question and a fundamental misunderstanding. It's about what is nation that? building. So the way we look at nation building, our conception in English literature, the literature that is available, or even in the political statements, is an external effort to build a nation in a war-trodden countries. That has proved to be a flawed understanding of nation building. The true understanding of nation building is an internal effort of nation building. It has now, to be an indigenous it absolutely. Wait, absolutely yeah. Professor, let me, let me say one thing. You just yeah, yeah, asked yeah, this yeah. question, and that if they withdraw the troops at once, they're going to be 
No peace and order in Afghanistan as if there That's is an ideal. That's what they fear the most. Look, as if there is an ideal peace and order and the order prevails in Afghanistan. Is this not an illusion that's created? Indeed. If well, we do that, that's going to happen. You know what? Yeah. So there, there is no order in Afghanistan in one way. For example, even if you withdraw, there's not going to be order. So let Afghanistan decide its fate. And well, let Afghanistan do. decide, but let mm. Afghanistan be wise enough to decide. No, they are. Point. I mean, if you ask, if you'd say this, that if human species yeah, survived in one certain geography, they're not wise enough, their survival says all right, they're wise all, enough. All right, sir. All right. I was just told that uh, <laughs> all right. we are out of time. Anyway, Ambassador, thank you so much. Goodbye, sir. And it was a pleasure having you, sir. And that's all we have for this hour. I'll see you tomorrow.